present the Autoship project, which is a project that is uh, funded by the Horizon 2020 program of the European Union. After that, we have Senna van Baalen, who will introduce to you the Avatar project, which is funded by the Interreg North Sea region. Um, Interreg program, yes. After that, we will go to CIFAR and they will give an insight in the, their company. That will be Louis Roberto. Then we have Edwin van Hassel, who will introduce to you the Novimar project. And then finally, we have Mats Bielse, who will introduce to you the Aegis project. A lot of things to tell, so uh, I'll put myself on mute for now and I give the floor to Anton. Oh, maybe one more thing. If you have the clap your hands like this, feel free to give an applause to the very interesting speakers. All right, Anton, the floor is yours. Uh, I suppose you're going to do the uh, moving of my presentation, is that correct? Um, I will ask Natasha to do it. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here today. And uh, I, hopefully it will be interesting for all of us. Uh, we are on an exciting route for developing autonomous vessels. And um, I will be shortly talking about uh, autoship and what the consequences are that for our company. Now, I am waiting for the presentation. If Natasha can put it on, it would be absolutely great because then I can say a lot more. Uh, quickly about myself. Uh, originally, I uh, was in other business than uh, inland shipping and short sea. Uh, but got there because I sailed a lot on tall ships. I sailed on the Belgian Navy. There is a Belgian Navy. Uh, mine, uh, sorry, mine is uh, uh, sweeping and fishery protection. And in 2011, I got the funny idea to design the vessel which you see behind me, which is a Zula barge, which is a specifically a barge for um, moving pallets and big bags. Uh, we found Zula Associates. Yes, next place, please. Which is next. Yep. Oops. There we go. We're gone again. There we are. This is a bit of a workout. Are you going? OK, next. Aha, uh -huh, we've got a problem, do we? Oh, yes, there we are. Um, yeah, next, please. Right, Zulu Associates is active as an initiator, and we develop uh, innovations in marine components of logistic chains. Specifically, we go for zero emission operations, because we believe that by 2030, we need to get as many maritime links in logistic chains as zero as emission as possible. Next one, please. Uh, okay, we've got a subsidiary, which is Blue Line Logistics, and Blue Line Logistics uh, participates in the AutoShip project, which I'm going to explain to you now. Um, AutoShip is a project uh, which is an initiative uh, specifically uh, for European waters, which aims at speeding up the transition towards autonomous vessels. And specifically, it will operate two different autonomous vessels, one for short sea, and one for uh, inland waterways. Um, and there will be uh, demonstrators to do a number of things within the next period. Next, please. By the way, you can see the uh, website uh, of the uh, AutoShip project is available, and uh, you have a lot of explanations there. But in any case, um, AutoShip is a large consortium. It's mainly driven by Kunzberg, but we have Sintef involved. Uh, Aidsvark is the shipping line uh, that operates the short sea vessels that is going to give the demonstrator. Um, we also have obviously the Vlamse Waterweg, uh, which I must say is one of the most uh, innovative um, administrations in Europe active on getting um, uh, autonomous vessels in operation. Um, we also have the University of Strathclyde, uh, Glasgow, who does a lot of the economic analysis and sociological analysis on uh, autonomous vessels. Uh, Bureau Veritas, looking at the operations, and all of it is run by the Italian company uh, PNO Ciao Link, which is the project leader. Uh, it's multidisciplinary. It's not just having autonomous uh, equipment uh, on vessels, but it's also all the elements around it, the economics, the social uh, and infrastructure elements, which are important. Next slide, please. Uh, as, it's, as I said, it will validate, the reason is to validate on board, uh, as well as in remote control centers on the shore, um, the use of autonomous vessels. And as I said, it's not just uh, the full autonomous navigation that we're looking at, 
Uh, it has everything to do with diagnostics, prognostics, operations, scheduling, all the communication technologies and integrating uh, the vessels in an upgraded e-infrastructure. So it is quite multidisciplinary. And I must say the interactions we have between all the different parties are, are very, very uh, exciting and very, very interesting. Um, the idea is to come to what is called the level five uh, autonomous operation. So it's not totally, totally autonomous uh, on a vessel working on its own, but nevertheless, it will have artificial intelligence on board. Next one, please. This is this uh, use case uh, for the short sea. Uh, the Eidsbach Pioneer is a vessel that does uh, transport fish feeds from the factories to the different fish farms in Norwegian fjords. Um, it's a very interesting vessel, by the way. It's also LNG powered, uh, but it is basically going to run with a reduced crew uh, using all the systems that will be uh, developed by Kongsberg uh, for being autonomous. Um, and of course, it will be uh, running mainly uh, in Norwegian waters, but uh, transfer to, uh, to Denmark is also on the offing. So it will be uh, testing to be used as a normal short sea vessel as well. Next one, please. The one we are involved in through Blue Line Logistics uh, is specifically using a Zulu barge uh, on inland waterways. Uh, the first phase is going to be along the canal in Mall, where we are today active. Uh, it will not only be autonomous as a test, but also be involved with actual commercial navigation. And by the way, uh, in Mall, we are already uh, testing uh, autonomous um, uh, mooring with magnetic pads on the vessel, which, by the way, is very successful. Uh, the main uh, test phase will then be uh, on the, the uh, uh, wind time situation, which is a very interesting um, location because it only allows us to use the vessel on a tidal waterway, the River Skelt, a large lock in Wintham, a large canal, small canal in Willowbrook, and a small lock, as well as going back again on the River Rupel on a tidal situation. Um, this is very exciting, and I must say we are very much involved in this, and the artificial intelligence is really being developed to operate this. Next one, please. Um, the reason why we're going for uh, autonomy is not to have fun, have nobody on board, but it's for achieving sustainability. Next. And we're basically looking at uh, why do we want to have it, because uh, the SDGs, and next, uh, uh, go ahead as well, please. Um, the SDGs of, and once more, yeah, basically uh, we want to go for zero emission and we believe that autonomy is part of the solution for going to zero emission and we need to take urgent action to do so on that climate change. Next please. And what we need to do next, yes, as we can see this is an analysis by the uh, University of Cambridge uh, Institute for Sustainable Leadership we really are at a turning point where we need to take the major actions to become sustainable. Next. And of course, we have the European Green Deal, which wants to have a zero pollution Europe and totally sustainable transport. And autonomy is part of that solution. Autonomy allows us to use uh, less uh, emission prone um, uh, power systems. Next, please. Right. What we find is that um, by having autonomous operations, we enable major cost savings in European vessels. And we do that by, next, lowering the operational cost by eliminating the crew while in transit, which means salaries, but safety equipment, food and beverage, all of that. Secondly, it lowers the insurance costs, uh, not only for the fact that we have less human error, but there are also no humans on board. If an accident happens, the risk of losing somebody's life is obviously much less. We lower the energy costs by being autonomous, uh, by better route planning, lower energy needs, and we increase data efficiency to digital exchanges. All of that allows us to, uh, with operation, autonomous operation, to have vessels, relatively smaller vessels, to be economically more competitive than larger manned vessels. And this also opens the door to, as we say, sustainable logistic systems. We have uh, smaller propulsion systems, therefore the sustainability, sustainable systems already exist. Think of fuel cells and so on and so on. We don't need high energy needs, which you do with, especially with vessels in narrow waterways. Uh, recently, we had a very interesting 
uh, example of what can happen in narrow waterway with the Ever Given, who, because of suction in narrow waterways, got itself on the bank. Redundancy, obviously, is increased. Uh, why? Because instead of one big vessel, we have smaller vessels. Therefore, if one breaks down, we can have uh, uh, reserve vessels taking the place. We don't need large infrastructures, which means we need to invest less in concrete in the ground, and we can use it for other investments. And we have less low water issues by using smaller vessels. Next. Uh, so what do we define as autonomous operation? Um, it's a vessel that can operate on the present waterway infrastructure. We have no crew on the vessel during passage or in transit. Uh, there is a remote control center in continuous contact for monitoring and controlling the vessel. Um, the autonomous equipment uh, can make situation awareness and can take analysis of the situation as well. That communication that is communicated from the vessel to the RCC. And then the RCC can intervene either in steps or actual real intervention uh, point to point. And that means there's still a human in the loop. Yeah. Obviously, there will be a fallback situation, and there's a lot of data gathering exchange with not only RCC, with, with ports, infrastructure, and other vessels. Today, a lot of communication is done by VHF, which is often uh, mutilated, uh, not very well understood. People with different language skills have different understandings. If we can do that all digitally, this will improve a lot of the communication between the vessels. If you look at the economics of the operation, yeah, we will have a lower investment because we don't have the accommodation and the safety systems. But on the other hand, uh, we will have a high investment because on board we have AI, we have sensors, we have redundancy, we have double systems, communication and remote control center. However, we have lower operational costs. As I said, the crew, the lower energy needs, the increased safety and the more efficient uh, planning for the voyage. And on the other hand, we do have RCC costs, <clears throat> additional equipment, maintenance, communication, and additional import supports like uh, people going on board, loading, unloading the vessel. But all of this gives us, and if you go to the next step. Uh, Anton, can I quickly, uh, not quickly interrupt? Um, we are short on time. Okay, I'll go much quicker. We have a margin for increased competitiveness. Next. So we think there's a huge replacement segment. Um, and we don't say we want to retrofit. What we basically say is we need to build new vessels. Next. And that's why we design two new vessels, which is the Zulu Mars. Next. Uh, I'll go quickly over it. Uh, again, the, in, the short sea fleet has an age of more, around 30 years. None of them can be made sustainable. And so we have a new design, the Zulu Mars. Next one which is this one, which is a 90 meter, three and a half thousand ton vessel, uh, which is going to be used for moving mainly containers. And as you can see, this is the pre-design uh, of a vessel without any crew on board. We, we are plan to operate this by 2023. Next one. And then we all have a new company which we set up, which is the Continental Inland Shipping Company. Next, which is going to design the X-Barge again, the dry fleet uh, and bulk fleet and the container fleet in uh, Europe, 70% um, of that is on average uh, 44 years old. So there's a real need to make it sustainable with retrofitting will not work next. And therefore we design an 85 meter uh, vessel which will take a 1500 tons ATTU. And that will be built as well in, and be operational by 2023. Next. I think we're at the end of the presentation. Is that okay? I think that uh, deserves uh, an applause. Thank you. Um, okay, so questions will be, wow, so many hands, great. Questions will be answered after the break. So now I would like to give the floor to Senna. Thank you, Anne-Sophie. Um... I think my screen should be shared now. Yeah, it's visible. OK, so um, I'll start by quickly introducing myself. So my name is Senna van Balen. I'm with the Intelligent Mobile Platforms uh, Research Group at the University of Leuven. 
And today I'll be talking about the Interreg North Sea Region project, which is called Avatar. Uh, it's about, as the title reads there, sustainable uh, urban freight transport with highly automated inland vessels. And I'm happy to hear that it has a lot of similarities with uh, the AutoShip uh, project that Anton just presented. So that's good. At least uh, I think it's good. Um, so the Avatar the premise, the initial premise of Avatar where, where we base this project on is we, we know that Europe has a fairly large and distributed uh, waterway network. So there are a lot of uh, rivers, uh, small waterways and rivers in and around cities. Um, but these, well, these smaller waterways are not very integrated in, in our transport system. Uh, they are mostly used for pleasure craft, but not really for, for cargo transport. Uh, it used to be, uh, they used to uh, 50 or 100 years ago, but it's at the last 30, 40 years, it hasn't been. So we identified some of the yeah, problems, why this actually occurs or why this is happening. So the, there, are, of course, there are many uh, things to identify there, but one of the main things is it's not really an economically viable way to do transportation. So the crew cost on these smaller vessels, especially when you have two or three crew members on board, is very high in relative to the, the cargo capacity of that vessel. And yeah, the, the innovation is quite limited in the past 30 years. So in Avatar, we wanted to try to unlock, unlock this potential again um, by increasing the automation. So that's the general pr uh, premise. And we are looking at an incremental approach. So what I mean with that, we, we don't want to go from, let's say level zero to level five in, in, in two years in terms of automation, but we want to see in which situation, in which scenario that a particular level of automation um, is feasible, can be applied on a, on a technological and economical level. So that is something uh, we definitely want to take a look at in Avatar. So I'll now, uh, quickly go over the consortium of Avatar. So as you can see in that image there, it's quite centered in Europe. So we have um, in Belgium, we have four partners. We have also in Netherlands, we have the University of Delft. And then in Germany, we have the University of Oldenburg as well as the Logistics Initiative uh, in Hamburg. The POM Ost Vlaanderen is leading this project. And as you can see, it's, it's quite a nice uh, triple helix formation. So we have in uh, universe, universities, we have uh, uh, policy makers or, or um, public agencies, and we also have commercial companies. Um, then a bit more about the context. So as I already said, we are focusing on urban environments. So that means the scale is much smaller than 100, and, uh, 100 tons. And what we actually want to achieve is we want to, as a use case, we want to go, we want to do urban uh, hourly traffic between uh, consolidation center centers outside the city centers to uh, inner city hubs. And you can see there on the right hand side, these are two examples of, of Belgium. So we have the city of Ghent, for instance, and also the city of Leuven. And what's interesting here, and it's also uh, EcoRV is also an external partner of the Avatar project. Um, but it's the, it's the waste, waste management uh, company in the province of Vlaams Brabant, and they are very interested in um, doing waste return from the inner city of Leuven to their waste disposal system around, uh, it's, uh, it's around Wilsle, so a couple of kilometers outside the city center. So that's, uh, for, for them, it's an interesting use case. It's one of the use cases we will be investigating in Avatar, and we will focus mostly on pelletized goods and smaller, so it's, that's, the, that's the scale or the context. Um, well, about the challenges, I, there obviously are many challenges related, related to this project, but I just picked uh, two of them. One of the main things is we want to connect a full chain operational supply chain models um, with the technological development. So that means we want to see which pitch business case or use case uh, fits a specific technological development and how can we exploit that in specific use cases. Uh, that's also actually the term sustainable, not only focuses on, on green drive systems. It also focuses on sustainable business cases that are durable for the next uh, 30, 40 years. And then also we want to aim at constructing a formal generic model for automated systems of systems. What I mean with that is 
Uh, we have a lot of different areas of, of research and developments, so different systems that we'll be, we'll be deploying. I'll get to that later. But uh, for instance, if the University of Oldenburg is controlling a vessel from our university, we we need to have some kind of formal language that we both understand so we can both make decisions on. So it's one thing to automate your own vessel. That's That's of course something you can start with, but in order to work in a highly situational aware context, you need to have some kind of model at some abstraction to communicate with uh, other systems. Then about the work packages in Avatar. So we have, I skipped the first two, so the the, the communication and uh, project management. So we have engineering, we have business policy and regulation, which is led by the logistics initiative in Hamburg. And then we also will be doing some tests and demonstrations, and these will take place in uh, Leuven. So the, the Maverick, which I will show to you later, is the one ton vessel. It's a research vessel of the University of Leuven that we will be uh, developing, or at least we will, we will uh, uh, it, it has already a basis, but we will increase its automation. Then the deployment of a new vessel that will be developed in this project, uh, it will be deployed in Ghent and maybe also in Hamburg. And then also, um, lastly, the fleet control, so vessel fleets, platooning, these kind of uh, things will be demonstrated in Delft, uh, mostly by the University of Delft. So yeah, since we are a research institution, um, I will briefly, br briefly elaborate a bit on the research context of this project. Um, so. The one ton vessel that we will be uh, developing, we already had it. Uh, so we have the hull. It, you can see on the left hand side, it's the old configuration, but it has limited maneuverability. Uh, so it's not really agile and it was not automated at all. So um, one of the goals of Avatar is to automate this from level one to uh, zero to two or higher. And we want to increase the, the maneuverability. We will also integrate a sensor box, which will contain both proprioceptive and exteroceptive sensors, but in a flexible manner. So it's not only, it's not a fully integrated box for this vessel. It can can be uh, deployed on, on other vessels as well. Another aspect, uh, which is mainly um, being developed in the University of Oldenburg, so the AMI research group, um, is focused on mobile uh, of um, remote control. So in a in a, in a mobile way. So we want to take over various systems. So not only focusing on taking over one system, but we should be able to have some kind of generic activation modeling that can be mapped with with uh, with every individual system in an efficient way. And we want want to identify in which scenarios. So which are the critical scenarios or environments that we need to take over control. So for instance, locks are are talking. Uh, on the left hand side, that's the remote control sensor of the University of Leuven. It's just a camera based system. Um, the, the one from Emit is much more elaborate, but uh, this is also part of the research. And then lastly, we have the research of University of Delft. They mainly focus on, on platooning, so fleet coordination. It's, it's a, a higher level of control, I would say, so more towards the coordination of vessel fleets. You see in the, in the video here, you see one leader vessel and the other one is just following with some minimal set of um, sensors. So this could be very relevant in terms of cost effective or cost efficient uh, deployment of, of new vessels in this small scale because it will be necessary to have a, a very cost effective model for, for both the sensors and instrumentation on board as well as the systems of systems automation. So. Um, yeah, and then lastly, I would like to uh, briefly discuss the collaboration and contributions of this project. So, of course, uh, we work together with local governments, uh, for instance, in Hamburg, but also in Ghent and Leuven. Uh, and then the waterway administrator, administrators, they play a very uh, vital role, vital role, I would say, in Avatar, because we, we get input, fr input from them and we also try to discuss the results, for instance, with the Vlaamse Waterweg, which, who are heavily involved uh, as an or, or monitoring the, the Avatar project. Um, so discussions on cost-effective infrastructure and, and ICT and mechatronic standardization are things that we are very welcoming to, to discuss this with external partners as well. We welcome input there because it will come from all parties already involved in the inland waterway shipping industry. So for instance, uh, the, the Zulus from Anton, we can get a lot of knowledge from that, but uh, also um, 
yeah, they're, they're everything, every every system that is currently being deployed already has some kind of uh, input. So we, we welcome that discussion. Uh, in terms of the avatar project, you can always go to the website there. Uh, and of course, if you have any more questions, feel free to uh, contact me or anyone from the consortium. So that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was a uh, very interesting. OK, we're already a bit short on time. Um, so uh, I propose that we directly give the floor to uh, CIFAR and to Louis Robert Cole. Good morning. Uh, my name is Louis. I'm from the company uh, CIFAR. Um, I will share my presentation uh, on our company and give uh, an oversight of our company and what we exactly do. Oh, this doesn't work. Yes, so our company is CIFAR Remote Ship Management, uh, a practical approach. Uh, we start with a, a short video on our uh, operations uh, to warm up. Goedemiddag, Michael op Shock Control Center. Ja, we zijn klaar. Jullie mogen de controle overnemen. So, CIFAR uh, Automated uh, Shipping. Uh, CIFAR develops technology and services for um, remotely uh, operation of automated barges and vessels, specifically for uh, inland shipping. Um, we have currently nine vessels under operations and we have two operational shore control centers, one in Antwerp and one uh, since the beginning of this week in Rotterdam and the third one is in preparation um, in uh, Charleroi. Um, our focus is inland shipping, uh, meaning vessels um, that we plan to automate for unmanned operation uh, like the Water Truck uh, Plus project, vessels under 55 meters and uh, with a limit to 650 tons on fixed trajectories and reduced crew vessels, vessels up to uh, 110 meters, like uh, the Diseo. Uh, we started our company from uh, the problem of the shortage of crew on those vessels, together with the high OPEX cost on small uh, inland vessels. Um, this called for a new approach. Um, our approach is that uh, we start from the control of the vessel from a shore control center. Here we see an example of our shore control center in Antwerp, uh, where licensed captains um, cooperate with onboard technical crew to navigate the vessel. Um, it is a cooperation with local personnel. Captains work in a shift and we train uh, personnel uh, to work in a control center and to have um, uh, to provide a safe operation and safe navigation with uh, the, the vessels. Um, we have a strong R&D uh, program uh, where we see the technology as a toolbox for uh, the persons and the captains in the shore control center. And we believe strongly that a combination of vessel autonomy, navigation, and remote pilotage support in maneuvers from the shore control center is the key for implementation for efficient uh, smart shipping. Uh, our R&D program is supported by uh, Horizon 2020 projects like 5G Blueprint and Novimove. As well, we cooperate with the European Space Agency and the Flemish Innovation uh, Agency. Um, Legislation-wise, we have a very strong cooperation with uh, Flemish Waterway Authorities and Port of Antwerp for um, permits and um, allowing vessels to navigate on a crew uh, reduced level. Um, our technology um, evolves uh, and as a toolbox, it provides uh, an efficient way of a captain navigating the vessel 
Um, here an example of our autonomy on the uh, water truck uh, 10 in the uh, uh, West Hook. Um, we see the software from CIFAR that uh, predicts the uh, navigation trajectory of the vessel, uh, where the vessel navigates the trajectory from itself. The captain from the remote control center has the possibility to intervene when it's necessary. In that way, we can really use the hours of navigation of a captain in a control center on a highly efficient way. Now, we're already an operational company. Eh? We have nine vessels under management, management meaning that we uh, operate a commercial model towards the market and towards the vessel owners, we have three ways of supporting uh, their operations. Uh, one is unmanned navigation, meaning on fixed trajectories that we can implement our system and provide support uh, on a fully unmanned uh, vessel, the smaller vessels. And then secondly, we have the crew supported navigation, meaning that uh, vessels with limited crew can extend their navigational hours by support and extra hours of uh, a shore control center. And then lastly, a bit of the same, is crew reduced navigation, meaning a vessel that's fully equipped for 24 hours operation can navigate now with less crew on board, but again with the support of uh, the sh shore control uh, center. Future-proof shipping. Uh, CIFAR believes that it's the combination of the human in the loop uh, with the support of technology uh, that will be the key to uh, smart shipping. Um, there will be a shuffle in uh, the job function, so we need to train the profiles who are working with this new type of uh, system. Uh, we need to train them well uh, to have a safe way uh, of operation. But the combination of shore control and autonomy uh, will be uh, the goal for the highest efficiency rate on the vessel. Our call is the best helmsman uh, stand on shore. Um, I will close my presentation and immediately uh, show, you, show you a short overview of our shore, shore control center, where currently our captains are navigating um, two vessels, uh, one vessel on the Albert Canal and one vessel um, on the uh, West Hook trajectory. This is uh, a live operation at this uh, moment. Crew reduction on the 110 container vessel on the Al Albert Canal. Crew reduction or unmanned operation on the uh, water truck. And the implementation of autonomy by a traffic controller in the second range. Okay, I hope this will start uh, a good debate on uh, smart shipping and what's already ready today for uh, implementation in the uh, market. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Um, great, very interesting. Let's go to another great presentation. I would like to give uh, the floor to um, Edwin and he will present Novimar. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let's see. There it is. I think you can see it, eh? the presentation. Yes. Okie dokie. Um, so also good morning uh, from my side. Um, just in brief, a very short introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Edwin, Edwin Nassel. I am officially a naval architect. <laughs> Studied at the Delft University of Technology. And after that, I moved to the University of Antwerp, where I did my PhD in uh, transport economics. I am still working at the University of Antwerp, and I'm also one day a week uh, back again at the uh, University in Delft. So also the thing that Senna Sen showed in his presentation uh, in the pond before the university, that's also where I am normally one day a week if there is no corona. <laughs> so that's uh, basically what, what I'm, uh, I'm also working at. Um, Within this position, say, especially from the point of view of the University of Antwerp, we are involved in the Novimar project. And the Novimar project is a project that's almost running towards its end. So it started in 2017 and will end uh, this year. I think it will end somewhere in October. And within this project, 
we actually looked into a different type of shipping concept where we were working on a concept where we where there were ships with less crew. So we're not necessarily aiming to zero crew in, in some ships, but we were working towards ships with uh, low manned uh, ships. Just a few settings or just a few a short background on the overall say uh, say case study that we're working on on the in the Rhine area. Um, there are some main trends that can be observed. First of all, you see, and that was also based on the presentation that we saw earlier, is that there is a lot of automation in, in inland navigation, but also in other modes of transport. So this is one common trend that wants through to, to the sector. On top of that, there is the increase of importance of the external cost, and meaning that we want to minimize those external costs. And one way of doing that is aiming for a model shift. So getting more cargo from road towards and especially in a botway transport, and also see that there is a an, an clear uh, trend of digitization. If we then zoom a little bit further into the settings of the inner navigation sector, um, then it's also basically what, what, what Louis said earlier, is that we are basically lacking crew members. And this is a graph I borrowed from uh, Edwin Verberg. And what he, act what he actually showed over here is that the available crew that is available that could sail on inland ships is actually reducing. So that means that Automation and automation projects are not necessarily a threat to the inner navigation sector, but they are uh, can be seen as an uh, as a solution to this uh, reduction in available uh, in available uh, crew members. On top of that, if we then look into the uh, IWT market itself, you can see that the market itself is very fragmented. Meaning that there are uh, a lot of ships that, that that are available on the market, especially for inner navigation, is that there are most of them are owned by only one owner. So meaning that almost for every ship there is one owner, meaning that there is all different types of companies. So there's not a lot of say concentration within this market, which is a little bit different compared to what's happening, for instance, in uh, in, in maritime transport. Having said this, I now hope that my movie will work. And you can have a look into the vessel train. Yeah. That was, say, a short, say, a very short introduction on the Novi Mar project. Um, as you can see from this movie, that there are a lot of different aspects that are, say, taking place uh, up to regulations and the implementation and the development of new technologies. But what I want to do within this say, short presentation is focus more, say, on the business economical uh, side of this project and smart shipping in general. Uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah. So um, if you now have a look into this project in itself, is that we want to improve the current waterborne transport system, meaning that we want to make optimal use of the available infrastructure that is already there. And by doing so, we want to say use this idea or this concept of this uh, of this vessel train. Um, wait. Apparently there is an issue with the movie, but OK. Um, OK, let's go to that. OK, um, where was I? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. OK, so we're, we're, we're back to, um, to, to to this idea of this, this, this vessel train. And the whole idea from this vessel train is that we will have a lead vessel, meaning that we have one ship that sails as some sort of, say, the locomotive ship, 
which is fully crewed. So that means that there are a lot of persons uh, working on the ship and they're actually under control of the, of the entire train. The idea here is that the ships that are following, so the ships that are following the lead ships are ships with, will have, which will have less crew. So those, those ships will have a cost reduction, so to say. So we can actually take people from those ships. Um, this is say the, the basic idea, what you also saw from, uh, from the movie. If you want to make, if you want to analyze this concept, you actually need to think of, okay, how we can, how could we implement this into a existing market? And then there are basically, there are three different layers or the three different actors that we need to take into account. So first of all, we need to take into account are the cargo owners, basically the ones that making use of the service. So that's actor one that we need to think of. The other one is are the vessel owners. So the, the, the persons or the companies that are actually executing this type of work. So we also need to take, in the, take that into account. And then thirdly, we need to take into account what we now call the organizers, or what we call in this project, the vessel train organizers, because we are having now two different entities. First of all, we have the different ships with all of their independent owners. And on top of that, we have this concept of the vessel train. And we need to have some kind of organization or actor that actually brings together lead vessels with following vessels. So this is a new entrant that's uh, that's in, in, in the market. So we need to think of these three different uh, actors. And then what we will do is that from these three different actors, we're actually going to calculate what are now the benefits if we implement this vessel train concept. So it's not the idea here to, to just to, uh, to, to go in full detail of the, of the formulas, what you see over here. But what we actually do is that we calculate, okay, what are now the costs for current operations, both for road, rail, and in the waterway transport. Then we implement a vessel train. And if we actually do the vessel train, we then compare, okay, what are now the costs for the vessel train? And we compare them to the current situation. And we do this for these three different actors and so for these three different levels. And we're actually going to compute, okay, what are now the benefits for these three different actors? Uh, how are we going to do this? Uh, in order to do this, we actually built a model. Uh, that's basically what Bukani did uh, together with, uh, with Eleni, the, 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 the persons working with us. Um, and what you can see here is just a, sh a short screenshot, so to say, of the of the software that's been developed. And this is basically the main, say, conceptual overview of the things that I just said. Uh, and then what we can do, if we have this software, we can actually, say, start playing around. It's called like that. <laughs> and we can actually look into different types of what we call vessel train constellations. So we can actually research what type of setting or what type of service can actually be beneficial for these different owners. And then what we figured out that this diagram of this map, which is basically what you see over here, is basically the one of the most promising options where such a vessel train concept could work. And this is basically the, the part of the network in Northwestern Europe where most of the cargo flows are being transported via inland waterways. So this is basically the access between Antwerp, Rotterdam and Duisburg. And then what we can actually do, we can link different types of waterways, smaller ones, but also bigger ones to this core network. And then what you can actually see is basically what you see on the bottom part of this diagram. You can actually see the, uh, how to call this, the, the, the different benefits for these three different actors. So for both for the cargo owner, the vessel train organizer, and the, uh, the, 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 the vessel owners. So we can actually compute all these different, uh, different benefits. Um, another thing that we can do with this concept, and this basically links a bit to what, what Louis said earlier, is that we can also make use of this concept of a lead vessel with, uh, with following vessels to improve the, uh, the productivity of ships, especially when it comes to smaller vessels. So you can actually have ships that could sail in B sailing regime, so 24 and 24, by actually deploying a crew, which officially is only allowed to sail 12 hours or 14 hours a day. And then what you can do, you could actually switch around the main, uh, the, the lead vessel with following vessels. So that's something that we can actually do. And we also uh, research this option. Edwin, can you try to uh, round I'll up? I will wrap it up. Um, I think this is just a short overview of the different sub designs or sub developments that we've created within the project. Um, and we also show what the impacts are if you should 
if you could work on, uh, say, pre-sorting cargo in order to reduce waiting times in ports, or if we could reduce waiting times by, by improving the handling operations. And we actually also researched what the, what's the impact of that. Um, and then the last diagram or the last picture that I want to show you are some pictures that I borrowed from uh, Evan, from the Linda, uh, and what you see over here. This is a test run of this vessel train concept of two or three weeks ago at uh, the Haring Vliet in the Netherlands, where there was actually an, uh, a ship, a container vessel that acted as, an, as a lead vessel, where a passenger ship was acting as a following vessel. The main purpose over here is that this would be a very nice demonstrator. And the reason why we have a passenger ship as a following vessel was that we could actually invite people to actually go to the ship and be on board of the ship. But due to the well-known reasons, that was not possible. Uh, so it's, uh, the, the actual test actually took place. And the overall results from this test case was that, that it actually worked. So it, uh, it was quite, quite nice to, uh, to see. And that was it uh, from me. So this is the website. So if you want to know more about this project, you can actually have a look at that. And that was it from, uh, from me. Great. Thank you. Applause. Thank you. Nice. OK, then um, up to our last speaker of today, which is Mats. The floor is yours. Thank you. I will just share my screen. Yeah, thank you very much and, and thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, and thanks for the, the, the really good presentations uh, given so far. <laughs> I hope I can uh, can give a little more uh, insight as well, uh, add to the uh, to some of the comments that have already been made. Um, yeah, my name is Mas Benton Billes. I'm from DFDS. Uh, uh, a Danish uh, logistics company uh, with services around Europe, uh, both in uh, on uh, short sea shipping between the the ports uh, shown here on the map, uh, having 62 vessels, but also trailers on the roads, trucks, and uh, also running terminals and uh, warehousing and cross dock functions, um, and have been doing so for the last 150 years or so. We are part of the uh, the Aegis project. Uh, looking into the autonomous ships meeting automated ports. So very much in line with what have been uh, been explained before. We have three use cases, a number of uh, tech uh, work packages leading into the three use cases, looking at short sea terminals, short sea and inland shipping interface in the case B that I'm, I will present a little more today, and then the revitalization of regional ports. Uh, all of this in, in the name of sustainability, and uh, optimization of uh, European networks, uh, transport networks. Um, here are an uh, overview of the partners. Project is led by Sense of Ocean that have been mentioned before. And then we have a bunch of, of ambitious companies from, uh, from, uh, from these uh, uh, partner organizations. I will take it a step back and, and uh, kind of, of add on to, to what the previous speakers have, have said before, but what we are looking into is sustainability. And um, this one is, is uh, this guy on the right, uh, he's yelling louder and louder. It could be, uh, be your, your family, sure. your colleagues, or it could be the customer. And the, it is the, the, uh, the customer that, that, that I will focus this presentation We're on as well. Getting, uh, no. Um, the World Economic Forum had uh, had had this uh, report uh, two years ago, and this year it has been changed to to all green in 2020. So everything is. Mats, I think you're muted. It looks like we lost him. You button press somewhere. Okay. <laughs> um, Welcome can back. You, can you see my, uh, my screen again and hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, what we want to do is to, to improve the, the energy efficiency on the existing operation, existing assets, and that is by optimization. So different digital tools, optimization of, of, uh, of uh, operation of, of, of the assets. And that is both vessels and, 
and uh, on on roads and terminals. And going forward, we need to look into the uh, to new fuels, and that is also supporting uh, the case in Aegis. Um, this one you probably know: the EU ambitions uh, moving cargo from roads to sea or waterborne. And these are the actual numbers. It is kind of going the wrong way. So Aegis will support the shift from from road to sea uh, in the development of the new transport network. How will we do that? Um, we will. We are looking at uh, more diverse sizes of ships. We are looking at mother daughter solutions. We are looking at more flexible ship systems, uh, adding flexibility uh, to the networks. Uh, we are looking at more automation both in the vessels, but also in the cargo handling, that is just as important. We're looking at standardized cargo units. That is, uh, for our case, we're transporting mostly trailers in DFDS, and that is, of course, uh, in, in, in focus in, in some of the use cases, but also uh, containers. And then we are looking at uh, new digital technologies. In the, the, um, in the technology uh, that we're looking into is uh, is a new terminal concept, um, containers, uh, cranes, and uh, and these mother daughter solutions. Um, and we're looking at connectivity. Use case A, A is looking at the short sea terminals in Norway, uh, led by NCL. Um, and that is the, the mother daughter concept that is being looked into there with the fast and easy distribution of, of cargo to, to smaller ports and terminals. Use case B is looking at uh, at the um, at the the uh, network in uh, Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, these the ports on the right hand side have been analyzed uh, in the project, uh, and we have just uh, released a report uh, looking at the uh, DFDS transport in this area and how we can optimize that transport. Key here is uh, cost, as has been mentioned before. It is uh, the speed of operation, especially transshipment time and uh, and sailing time. Um, and then it, it is, of course, the flexibility uh, in the network and safety in the end. The last use case is uh, a revitalization of, of smaller ports and city center terminals, and that is being looked at in Aalborg and Vordingborg in Denmark as the uh, as the case leads. These are an overview of, of some of the presentations that we have seen uh, before. We are in the project now going into looking at new vessel concepts um, and uh, different cargo systems for that. Uh, that is led by ISE in Germany. Um, and we are developing uh, these new, new vessel concepts in the Task 9.2 and uh, other work packages. And hopefully we will be able to present something in the beginning of next year on this. And uh, as I see, there, there are a lot of overlaps and a lot of great synergies between the projects that have just been uh, been presented. I, I really hope that we, after this meeting, can uh, can continue the dialogue and the and possible exchange between the different projects because I, I think there are some some really good uh, knowledge in in this group. Um, just to as a, as a last comment, just to 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 comment on on this link between um, uh, yeah short sea shipping, inland shipping, and the roads. We are looking at other projects as well and, and looking at these integrated networks. Um, one of the projects that we, we are also involved in from DFDS side is the award project, uh, looking at uh, all weather autonomy for real logistics operations and demonstrations. So developing um, trucks, developing uh, uh, port vehicles, uh, hub to hub transport and logistics vehicles, and also airport vehicles. So this is, of course, linking to the to the autonomous vessels, and and we we see it as a as a kind of a whole, um, and and we need to to find the synergies between uh, between these two um, uh, worlds. This is uh, one of the cases that are linking into the uh, to the use case B and the inland case, and that is the handling of uh, cargo on the on shore side, delivering cargo uh, to the vessels. Uh, we have. Uh, cargo on the roads, it needs to be gated in, it needs to be handled in the terminal, and in the end it needs to go on the vessel. All this we are looking into automating as well, and uh, with the benefits that have been mentioned before in, uh, in previous, uh, previous presentations. So that was a really quick one. I hope you, I made the, the time uh, <laughs> um, yeah, as well. 
<laughs> and um, yeah, more information is on the on the website. Uh, we will uh, work on this project for the next three years, um, and hopefully we will uh, have a lot more to to tell from the project in the coming months and years. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mats. All right, then we arrived at the end of our first part. Um, checking the clock, it's 11. I propose that we uh, come back here at 10 past 11 sharp and then we start with our panel discussion. OK, so see you all at 10 past 11.
All right, everybody. Let's start again. Good, great to see everybody back. So now we're going to start with the panel discussion. And the goal of today is that we discuss with our interesting presenters how automation uh, will contribute to the efficient and sustainable inland waterway cargo transport. And we will discuss some challenges and uh, solutions that their projects can bring to the sector. Your questions, as I already said, will be uh, handled throughout the panel discussion, but I would also like to have you involved through some polls. And I don't know um, how many of you are um, familiar with polls, so I would like to just try out one just for fun. Natasha, are you there? And can you open the first poll? Yes, and I'll share the screen for you all to see. So first question, if you had a pet octopus, what would be the name? I'll give you just a few seconds for this. I don't think it's such a difficult question because uh, it's very close to the waterway, of course. They live in the sea. All right, I see some very nice uh, answers. And I think, Natasha, we can close the poll in a few seconds. Oh, and now the answer disappeared. That's a, that's a shame. Anyway, um, can we show the answers of the poll? I don't know. Show results, maybe here. Yeah. Well, I have to uh, tell you something. I actually have a pet octopus and the name actually is Eddie and he will be my timekeeper for today. So I would like to ask everybody um, to switch off your cameras. Only the panel speakers will be uh, visible and octopus, Eddie. Um, he will be my timekeeper and now he's happy, but when the time is up, he will get very angry so i would like the panelists to keep in mind the octopus to check the timing because we have a lot of questions i've seen and i also have a lot of questions so i need to be efficient next to that um if somebody is talking um please the public should be muted of course um if somebody of the panelists would like to intervene uh raise your hands with the button then i can uh, give you the floor and i think that's it for now Is there something in the chat? Because I see a raised hand. These are all the questions, okay. Um, so the my screen is still shared. You can ask your questions through the Slido on the website or through the, the scan. All right, so um, Natasha, can you launch the second poll? This one is for real. We have heard uh, five interesting stories. Um, but maybe you came here to learn to know something else. So my question for the audience is, if you can describe it in one word, which topics or trends or areas do you want to learn more about today? I'll give you a, a little minute. A lot of different answers. Just give you a few more seconds. OK. Um, Natasha, can you uh, start closing the poll in a few seconds? And then the answers are still visible. Great. OK, um, let's play a little game with the panelists. 
Um, on the screen, you can see a lot of uh, different uh, topics, very interesting all, but I would like for you all to pick out one word that resonates with you, and I'll give you uh, about one minute time to talk about it and how it relates to the projects or the ideas you're working on. Um, I propose for now that we just go through, uh, how do you call it? I'll just shout the name and uh, that person can uh, take the floor as first. So uh, let's start with Anton. Um, well, I'll take insurance because I saw somebody also put a question on it. Um, insurance is um, actually going to be cheaper by using autonomous vessels because of two things. First of all, you get rid of all the uh, um, human error. Uh, I've been operating now vessels since 2014 and basically 90% of the accidents we had were due to human error. And the second one is that if you have nobody on a vessel, then you risk no lies when something happens. And to quote an insurance company that said to us, oh, if there's nobody on a vessel, well, it can sink, it doesn't matter. We don't have any lives to insure. Now that's a boutade, but I think that is a main point. Insurance is going to be cheaper, which lowers the cost and makes it more interesting than existing vessels. There you are. Great, and you kept uh, Eddie happy. Very nice. Then uh, I'd like to ask uh, Louis. Thank you, Al-Sophie. Um, I will uh, choose sailing time for shore control center helmsman eh? because I think there are a lot of questions on the operational side and the operator in a shore control center. Uh, the sailing time for uh, a shore control center operator is eight hours. Eh? And it's eight hours because uh, one of the strate strategic reasons behind it is we want to make the job as an operator in inland shipping, sexy again. As you know, there is um, uh, not enough uh, inflow of young people in the sector, and most reasons are that they are long working hours on board of the vessel. So if we want to attract people in a shore control center, we need to switch to uh, a more reasonable uh, working time for uh, those operators. So eight hours. Thank you. I don't think I need any. <laughs> um, let's see what Senna uh, would like to choose. <clears throat> well, uh, then in, I, in that case, I'll pick uh, situational awareness, um, which is obviously linked with other words that I see there. So like uh, perception and data exchange, exchange uh, and also cybersecurity. It's, it's a more of an overarching term, I would say, but it's extremely relevant, I think. Um, so as I also said in the presentation, it's one thing to automate your own system, your own vessel. But if we want to work together with, with several systems in an automated environment, we need to understand each other. So we need to speak the same language. Uh, and we need to have some kind of model that we know we both understand or all, all of the systems understand. So we need to be aware of our situations. Uh, I think there's a massive opportunity here. Uh, and it's spread over all these projects, but to contribute to this, uh, I think it's extremely relevant for, for the next couple of years to to make these fundamental things, to do them right and benefit from them in the substantially in the coming. Time's up. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for your input. Then I'd like to ask Mats. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would pick, uh, Vessel size and, and in relation to that economic feasibility, which is in, in the center of what we are doing at the moment in, in, in the EGIS project. Uh, the vessel size is, of course, uh, limited by, by some, some physical features of the, uh, of the inland waterways. We have some CMT classes that we need to look into, uh, but also some cargo flows and some, uh, some capacities on the vessels. Um, we are looking into uh, transport of trailers. Uh, uh, securing a fast transshipment time uh, and also uh, easy handling in the end destination, re reducing uh, reducing the last mile or first mile transport. Um, and that is, uh, I think, that is is, is key to unlock this um, with autonomy as well. Is is uh, is that we we have the uh, the fully flexible system and the, and some vessel sizes that that can be handled. Um, and I see that that uh, all the vessels that have presented been presented today is is. Uh, is rather small, I would say. <laughs> um, so I, I think the, I, I'm, I'm really eager to actually discuss this further also going forward. Right Time's now, up. oh, sorry. 
<laughs> no problem. <laughs> we will uh, discuss it later on with the next questions. Okay, then, uh, um, Edwin, can you? Yeah. Uh, then yeah. I will take the biggest word in the in the cloud, the regulations. <laughs> um, I think. Uh, with all of these different types of projects and what we also had in, in our project is that we need to change a few of the regulations in order to make these things happen. And the question is, is that possible? And what we did within our project, and I think this is also feasible for the other projects, is that you basically need to comply to three main elements. The first of all is that your innovation as such is safe so that there's no risk of, of doing your, your new innovation, that your solution is technically feasible so that it works yeah, from a, also from a technical standpoint. And then thirdly is that what you're doing makes economic sense so that you're actually saving money one way or another or that you create uh, welfare for one, one of these actors. So I think if you comply to these three different things, then also regulators are much more interested in looking into changing the rules and or regulations. So in this sense, say regulations as such should not be seen as fixed. And now I see that I pissed off Eddie <laughs> and I will shut up. <laughs> Thank you. I think that was a very nice first round. Um, for the people in the audience, if you hear something that has been said by uh, our panelists, feel free to put it also in the Q&A. And I think now it's actually a good time to go and see how the Q&A looks like. Okay, and I would like to ask Flores if she can highlight uh, one of these questions for uh, us to answer. There is one. All right. So this is one for CIFAR. How do you ensure the connection between the vessel and your control center? And how do you prevent lag in the communication? Uh, very good question, uh, because the communication is key between a uh, ship and a uh, shore control center. And one of the biggest points uh, for development um, in uh, smart shipping. Um, connection is ensured by uh, multiple um, land-based um, uh, and, and public uh, 4G communication uh, antennas. Uh, where there is a balancer between uh, the different kind of antennas and different kind of operators. And that's layer one. Uh, layer two is uh, the use of local 5G networks. Uh, for example, in the port of Zeebrugge, there is a 5G network. In combination, uh, third, with a backup uh, satellite, uh, satellite connection in case of the first options uh, fail. Afterwards, uh, because this is, this is only about communication, Afterwards, you have one, the autonomy, the, the fail-safe procedures, and of course, in case of crew is on board, the fail-safe procedures with the crew on board to mitigate the, uh, uh, or um, yeah, bring the vessel in safety in case of loss of, uh, loss of connection. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We still have time for a second question. So I think the first one has been deleted, and now we have one for um, Senna and for Edwin, what happens if a vessel in the vessel train has a mechanical failure? How do you handle that? I don't know who of the both of you would like to start to answer. Mm, that's the same for me. I can start and then I can give the word to Senna oh. if he wants. <laughs> um, the, for these things, uh, the, the, the issue is from the Novimar point of view is that there will always be at least one person at these what we call following vessels. So suppose that something goes wrong or there is a failure, there is always someone there to intervene. Um, we're now still having this discussion on what then the, ex the exact role is of that, 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 that person. But the overall idea here is that there is at least someone there, at least one person that could intervene if things go wrong. If that's not the case, then you could also think of having, say, redundant or triple redundant systems or you can even switch to a uh, fail and uh, safe fail operations so that the actual the ship should more and should park itself so so to say at, at the edge of the waterway if, if something go, could, 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 go, could go wrong or something like that but in the case of Novima there is always a person available that could intervene when things could, uh, go wrong. Thank you. Senna do you have something to add? Uh, well it's it's quite similar but I think uh, 
indeed the first issue is safety so whenever that happens uh, mooring for instance like edwin said to the to the shore side in a safe manner that's step one i would say and have a fallback scenario in place um, so first of all having a fallback scenario for communicating there's a failure so that's that's one thing that's the most important thing so making sure everyone knows you have a failure failure and then uh, the fallback scenario whichever that is so yeah so, Okay, thank you. I see that Anton would like to add something. Well, you know, yes. What happens if you have, uh, you know, crewed or uncrewed? If you have a crew on board and something goes wrong and they can't do anything, what do they do? I mean, we saw it last week or two weeks ago with the vessel, Amasa's vessel in Norway, where the crew got in, in trouble and they all got taken off by helicopter and then the rescue crew was put on, on the vessel. So in essence, there's no need to have a crew on the vessel. Because if things go wrong, they often can't repair it anyway. So, you know, that's just an idea. Thank you for uh, your addition. Does somebody in the in the panel would like to react on this? All right. Mm -hmm. Yes, Senna. Yeah, well, well um, the tricky thing is that we identifying what the, so this, this is an example of a mechanical failure but identifying the the origin of that failure that's, that's the most tricky thing so in some cases you will be able to relatively easily fix it by putting someone else on board or to, doing it on the shore side even or maybe it's a communication issue but yeah uh, if your system is able to explain what is wrong that that would be a nice way to 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 see for for someone okay we need to m pull this ship back to the to the terminal or something or we can fix it on site so that there is uh, some decision making that uh, needs to be taken into account at that point so identifying the failure yeah okay and i see ellen would like to add yeah maybe also to respond indeed that uh, if you look into say the in towards towards automation there was quite some interesting research done also with one of the colleagues at the delphi university of technology where one of the PhD students actually sailed along with a crew. So she climbed on board of a short sea container vessel that sailed from, I thought it was from Ireland towards Antwerp. And during that five, six day uh, journey, she actually discovered that the crew on the ship is doing much more than only navigating. And they're also keeping all the systems that are on board alive. So they're actually keeping the engines up and running, keeping the systems up and running. So they're I, I do agree that to a certain extent, from a navigational point of view, you could actually say reduce a few crew members, but there are also, especially at the existing vessels, there are still machinery still available that need maintenance and need people that actually keep the things up and running. Uh, well, I will add to that. Uh, indeed, because our vessels are not well designed. They are designed to have people on board. And when you make autonomous vessels, you need to make the vessels that do not need people on board while in transit. And for example, using diesel engines is a problem because diesel engines need a lot of maintenance. And so in other words, retrofitting existing vessels to be autonomous is an, is a, is an, is a non-event non because if you do that, existing vessels always need people on board because the systems have not been designed to be autonomous. So retrofitting existing vessels is something we one shouldn't do. Yeah, that, that's I think we something we can agree on. Yeah. Well, I would like to add something to that because um, currently today we are retrofitting a lot of um, existing vessels, and I think it's necessary for the acceptance in the market. Eh? I believe, and I yes, I, yes, I, yes, I agree totally. that we we should move towards a new built fleet that are built for unmanned and autonomous operation. But we are in a period that we need to prove to the market that this kind of technology actually works and is beneficial for all parties involved. And that's um, the only uh, way possible is by retrofitting uh, vessels at this stage. I agree totally with you, Louis. Uh, I was talking about the end game. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, everybody. I think we still have time for one question from the audience. Rodis, which one do you choose? Ah, okay, one for CIFAR. Explain a bit more about permits and implementation protocols at national level for remote piloting from SCC and how IMO is supporting this approach. Yeah, um, it's on the regulatory level, very good question. And, and I think 
maybe I'm not the best person to answer it because Anne-Sophie is actually the expert in this case. But um, Flanders is at this stage uh, the front runner in um, allowing and, and working towards um, implementation of new regulations for um, um, uh, autonomous operations and unmanned shipping. Uh, uh, since 2018 on the Flemish waterways, uh, the, the Flemish Waterway Authority and Flemish government opened the waterways and the waterway system towards testing um, of unmanned and autom automated uh, navigation. And it goes as follows. Uh, we, we, we write a, a CONOPS, a concept of operations uh, first. Two, we, we write an FMA or risk analysis. And three, we write a gap analysis on which le current legislation we will um, file for an exemption. Um, those three parts, um, and it's a, it's quite a big file uh, in the end, uh, is revised by the Flemish waterways authorities. And next you will receive, if positively evaluated, um, a permit for a uh, five year that is renewable after evaluation for every year. Um, so that's the case in the Flemish Waterway Authorities. It cannot be underestimated that this part is actually the most important part in the development of new technologies and being a, uh, a pioneering and a front player, one as a region and two as companies in Europe. Because in other countries we see testing is not allowed, so we cannot gain operational experience. In the Flemish waterway authorities, we see a lot of companies moving very quickly in the development of their technology because it is in cooperation with uh, the Flemish waterways authorities. On the IMO, um, that's um, a bit out of my reach, but I think Anton uh, has a, a lot of connections with the IMO, so maybe he can fill, it, fill in here. Um, well, IMO is working on this. Uh, it has developed very quickly because in June 2019 it was sort of, we'll see, but now it has moved very quickly and is uh, working very uh, much on getting a, a process of uh, uh, allowing it and, and adapting regulations. IMO has also realized that if they don't do it, they will become irrelevant. Um, we, as a matter of fact, with the vessel you see behind me, we have instigated the negotiations between the UK, Belgium and Holland to have a tripartite agreement with those three countries as authorities and as class to sail autonomous vessels across from the continent to the UK uh, <clears throat> within IMO framework, but not necessarily with the agreement of IMO. So it is possible to do it. Um, and it is going very, very quickly indeed. Whereas, as I said two years ago, it was something for 2050. Now it's uh, going to happen very quickly indeed. All right, thank you. Um, I saw in the oh, uh, Senna. Okay, you have some uh, some more seconds to uh, add. No, no, no. If it's if you wanted to move to the next question, that's okay, Jan Sophie. I think everything is interesting, so go ahead. No, I actually wanted to ask uh, you or the Flemish uh, waterway. So I fully agree with Louis and, and Anton that all the insights they gain from, from an operational point of view, they are extremely relevant for, for validation and, and seeing what what which types of, of um, protocols will be, will be in place uh, at the end. And I was wondering how the Flemish waterway evaluates these um, feedback or is it a closed feedback loop uh, to put it like that? So is it moving towards an, an yeah so how is it evaluated is it moving towards a standard or is it moving towards um, focusing on on specific companies or what is the okay i will only just shortly reply to this because the, today is not my focus it's yours um on the short term we focus just on practicality it has to work it has to be safe and we don't care what you bring towards us as long as you can prove it's safe and we believe it's safe then it's okay but in the long term it is more beneficial to have it as a standard but that's something we uh, have to work on together with uh, the whole sector that's not for uh, immediately okay yeah, of course we can discuss it later on as well, of course, if you want to. But um, I would like to come back to the first poll we had. Uh, and I saw that some uh, participants are wondering about business cases 
and some expectations concerning implementation of the projects and the business cases. And actually, I'm wondering the same. Um, could some of you um, tell me a bit more about their idea of like the, which kind of markets can uh, automation bring towards inland navigation or how your project can support a new business case? And I was thinking maybe Mats could start, yeah. if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I think I will go back and say, uh, talk about this link between the, the sustainability or the, the going green and the autonomy. Um, going green will not, uh, or uh, zero emission transport will not uh, necessarily provide uh, additional rates or higher rates. It will be more or less the same. Instead, we are looking at um, at large customers, the customers with, with, uh, with uh, big volumes uh, that we can build a case up around uh, and then do the investments with as security in a longer term uh, commitment between us as an operator and uh, the customers uh, with a transport need. Uh, as we, as many of the presentation, I, th I think uh, more or less all of us <laughs> said that the the autonomy will uh, will make it possible to to make a viable business out of of, of smaller vessels. Um, from DFTS side, we are bil building really big vessels at the moment for the for the short sea shipping. 450 trailers are coming into to Ghent. Uh, every day uh, in one vessel and is then needed to be distributed from there. Um, so so there, there is a, it is moving towards uh, bigger vessels in many areas, uh, in economy of scale and environment of scale as well. Um, but I, I think the autonomy will unlock lock the potential for smaller vessels also. Okay, thank you. Um, Edwin, do you have something to add? Uh, yeah. I think uh, yeah, I agree with what 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 Matt said. Eh? So I think indeed these types of, of of applications make say business cases for smaller ships better. But I think there are also applications for larger ships. So it it is not the one is not excluding the other. But you see that indeed from from a uh, say technical no not from a technical point of view. Say just from a uh, if you look into the relative shares of crew costs for smaller ships. They are much higher compared to, to to the larger vessels. So from that point of view, it makes it makes sense to to start off with these with the, with these smaller ships. But also, like I said, for this with larger inland ships, and even for short sea short sea vessels, there are still some applications that are that are possible even to 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 go further with these types of automation. And I think the other thing over here is that um, you see that you see new entrants coming into the market, and I think that Louis is one of these, and, and Anton also are two of these examples. So you see that if there's a radical new change and there are new things being developed, you see new companies, new ideas popping up and jumping into the market and developing new things, things that say wouldn't come say from the say call from the traditional side of the of the inner navigation sector. And then you see that, that things can go very fast. And that's say the main difference between now and a few years ago is that you see all of those new ideas coming up and popping up and being tested and being and being executed. So that's and all, with all of these things, you get new business ideas and new business concepts and new business models, which could further support, say, the, the, the growth and the, the sustainability and such for the, for the navigation sector. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody else from the panel would like to add, or can I go to the next question? I have so many. Yeah, yeah Louis. maybe okay. maybe to to um, to highlight two points. Um, one and the business case. It's it's. Far most the most important part in in um, implementing uh, autonomy. Eh? We are in a transport uh, business. Transport is a cost. Eh? Um, when we look at implementing autonomy and shore controlled navi navigation, eh, the impact on the the cost uh, structure uh, it changes, but it doesn't decrease the whole crew cost on board. Uh, with changes, I mean that the cost uh, on board can be. The crew cost on board can be, instead of a fixed cost, can be a variable cost. It will changes the way of doing business completely. And then you have the other side, because we can always look at the cost, but we can always um, look at the other uh, side of the case, and this increasing revenues. And by implementing shore control or autonomous navigation, it's possible to have with the same capacity of vessel, increase the revenue on uh, on the the operational hours per vessel. For example, and we have the the vessel with one captain on board, is limited on 10 hours navigation a day. But by adding 
technology, it means that the case of navigating uh, can be extended up to 24 hours, but let's say for six hours, and that six hours can make the difference in a strong business case and uh, the total revenue a vessel can run per year. So two sides in the, the business case stories, one, eh, the cost side, but there is more business continuity. And secondly, eh, increasing revenues is an important part in the business case. Uh, and I would like to add this, as soon as you have one person on board, your economics case goes the wrong side. So you basically have to make have nobody on vessel. I know it's very extreme, but it's also something which is going to make the industry disruptive. And I don't agree with Edwin uh, on the larger ships. But the problem with large ships is that you cannot make them sustainable at the moment. The technology does not exist. We today are already talking to clients who want to have zero emission vessels by 2023, 20, 24. Uh, and uh, as you have, a, when you have a large vessel, it's impossible to do that. And that is going to make a whole lot of change. All right, thank you. Um, I see that questions keep on coming in the, um, our Q&A. Um, before we jump back into those, I would like to uh, try out uh, another poll. Natasha, can you open it? I'll share it on the screen. We heard a little bit uh, about the business cases and about the goals um, our panelists have with their projects. But um, what do you as audience see as the biggest challenge to achieve those goals. You have uh, like 30 seconds to um, write it down. Eddie is counting, still there. And in the meantime, I would like to ask uh, our panelists to think for it themselves, to choose for themselves a word, to write it down or whatever, keep it in your head. And then I'd like to see if we close the poll how much difference the audience thinks from you. And I would like to give you all the word again for uh, a minute or so. There is Eddie. Eddie is getting angry. So Natasha, can you close the poll, please? Thank you. All right. A lot of uh, input again. Um, Anton, do you want to start? Yeah, why not? Um, the main problem is going to be and is conservatism. Uh, when I started in inland shipping in 2014, but even before that, the main word I heard by people around it, no, it's impossible. That's the usual answer when you want to change something. And a lot of people want to keep on. And, I, and one has to um, uh, respect the, uh, the professionalism of a number of people and the traditional way of doing things. And it was very good whenever it, it was the right environment. But now we have to change this business and it has to mean change the way we look at things, change regulations, which matter of fact is just people making agreements between each other and really go for sustainability, which I think uh, opens up a lot of things. That means change and change is difficult. Disruption is difficult. Thank you. Um, Senna. What is your point of view? <clears throat> well, if I may, Anne Sophie, I would like to add something to this uh, conservatism because I think um, it's, of course, a very prominent word in, in, in this industry or in this sector. But I also believe, uh, that is personally, that it also has or brings out an, an opportunity. Because it's it's such a conservative sector and, it, and the limitation of the innovation was limited in let's say the last 30, 40 years, and there are, there are some some relevant parties who did not already jump on on this new uh, autonomy wagon. That is definitely the case, but it also makes for a, a, an opportunity to do things right from the start. So with autonomous cars, a lot of vendors started uh, integrating systems, and the technology to drive an autonomous car is quite off the shelf. At this point, if you ask it at Google, for instance, they have been doing it for 20 years. But integrating this in a systems of systems, in a in an environment where multiple vendors and, and companies are sailing, I think that is not done right in in for for autonomous vehicles um, or on autonomous cars, because yeah, that's that step was skipped actually, and because this sector is such a conservative one, we. We do have that opportunity to do it from the from the ground up. So I think it's also it's not only a bad thing. That's what I wanted to 
give some optimistic opinion about uh, this term. Thank you. Okay, then uh, Louis, do you have a, a word? Um, yeah, I see uh, a lot of words on feasibility, economics, costs, and 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 and, and finance. Uh, I think our company has did uh, at this stage is approved that currently this project. Uh, can be viable, one on an operational level and on a financial level. But of course, uh, it's on the, the first mover and we are in a very early stage of this industry, but we are transforming very fast. And the reason why we are transforming in this industry very fast is, is the shortage of crew. And I think it's not mentioned enough here, but the problem will get bigger and bigger and it have, will have an, an impact on business continuity but also will have an impact on the finance case. Crew costs will only grow in the coming years because there are no captains anymore. There is no inflow of new captains anymore. So there is, um, there is the only way to, to achieve the EU, EU Green Deal ambitions for uh, modal shift and inland shipping is Partly, uh, partly automation, and I think today is already feasible. But with the technology development, it will get more economically feasible uh, by time, more and more, and faster and faster. Thank you, Matt. Do you have a, a challenge or something to add? Um, yeah, it's kind of linking to to many of these, um, starting with conservatism, and, and um, what we have looked into also is the. Uh, the kind of the, the financial innovation that is necessary to do this uh, renewing of a fleet, it's, it's a huge amount that is, or a huge investment that is necessary to actually re, the, the renew the entire fleet. Um, and there we, we, we need some, some uh, a lot of are talking about uh, servitization of, 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 uh, of, of, the, of the business in, in many aspects. Uh, it could be power as a service provided by, by someone else. It could be the vessel itself. Uh, or, or other other parts of the um, of, of of this logistics chain. Um, there, there was a, a market review recently did, uh, presented by the Danish uh, Ship Finance, uh, talking about this uh, financial aspect of of uh, of the of the transition, both green and autonomous, um, which is is quite interesting, maybe to read into by by the people uh, um, listening in here. Um, so I think the, the, the transition is, is really interesting and how fast it can actually happen. Um, okay, thank you. And then uh, uh, the last challenge for Edwin. Yeah, maybe just maybe a small thing to add over here that uh, all basically also linked to, to conservatism is that the sector and maybe the IWT sector as such, maybe, maybe is not that conservative. I think most of the things is that changes are difficult because it's very difficult to make a, a, a viable business case. And you see that, especially when it comes to greening or to automation, all of these other things, is that um, if there is no direct benefit for the ship owner and they are investing a lot of money to make the ship greener or whatever without uh, the shipper, so the cargo owners, paying a little bit more for that, then it becomes very difficult also for the ship owner to make, actually make that type of investment. And then I think if you link it down back more towards, say, the automation where we're discussing right now, is that if you then indeed have direct benefits, either by a productivity gain or by cost decrease or a combination of the two, then you can actually see that you could actually make such a case. And then if you then add on top of that maybe uh, more uh, investments into greening to other type of engines or whatever, then you could actually make such a case. So I don't think that the sector is be positive more, more towards the sector that is not that that conservative at all of not that conservative let's put it like that I, I just would like to add what will be the challenges what about all the assets that will be worthless and that's going to be a major problem how to solve that yeah it, it, that is a challenge if you when, when was it Stopford announced last week or so that transforming the maritime industry towards zero emission would cost eight trillion dollars more or less yeah, that was a rough estimate. And that, that's just replacing the ships and not indeed by scrapping the existing ones. Yeah, it's a lot of leverage, economic leverage as well, a lot of opportunities. So there is a, a lot of yeah, a lot of a lot at stake, a lot of money. <laughs> Exciting times. Yeah. yeah, sure is. Um I would like to go back to the QA of our public, and I have seen that uh, quite some questions have been asked asked concerning infrastructure. 
So uh, I would like to have some uh, panelists uh, uh, giving their point of view on infrastructure. But before I give you the floor, I would like to ask Flores, because I saw that uh, a lot of things have been said about conservatism. Can you, in the meantime, when our panelists are answering the infrastructure question, scroll through the Q&A to see whether there are some remarks from the public concerning conservatism? Then uh, there is a little more interaction as well. And I suppose that silence means a yes. So, um, mm, uh, Edwin, maybe can you start concerning uh, Novimar and uh, how you uh, do the lock passage? What challenges you? Uh, yeah, the, 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 in, in, indeed, there were some challenges with that one. <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, we were actually looking into is to have what we call, say, a priority call when a sh when a train is passing a lock. Um, you could imagine that if you have an, a train of ships and you need to wait before a lock and not all of your ships can pass that lock at one time, uh, you're actually wait, your, your actual say, the sailing time will increase and actually say jeopardize the overall efficiency of taking persons from your ship. Um, this is also something that we've discussed also with the people from the province of North Holland uh, in the Netherlands and they were actually not against it. So that was quite challenging, so quite interesting to see. Um, that even from, say, an, an infrastructure provider point of view, they were not against having things uh, linked towards, uh, say, uh, scheduling lock operations, so that you can have a schedule when you can, when you arrive at the lock with your train, you could actually pass as a whole to to, the, to that lock, and you could have some some form of, of priority. So that was one of the things that we actually looked into, and that was uh, uh, something that say more that was was. That type of operation is basically the only thing that could work if you want to operate trains on a network. That was, say, the main, the main conclusion over there. Okay, thank you. Somebody from the panel um, who is uh, more working towards uh, completely unmanned or autonomous vessels, how do they see uh, the infrastructure and the challenges or opportunities? Uh, if I may, <clears throat> autonomous vessels need to have a planned trip. So you can plan when you pass certain uh, locks, for example, or bridges. And that allows the uh, the authorities, in this case, the Vlaamse Waterweg, to uh, schedule when you should be at a lock or when you should not be at a lock, which means that we can must, m much better organize the use of the infrastructure that we have. And I think uh, instead of somebody suddenly showing up because they've started at some time, whatever, it, it, this, this, this planning is, is going to be uh, very interesting and in making everything also hold the whole of the inland shipping much more efficient. Uh, the, the big question will be, how do you physically pass a lock with uh, some, nobody on, on the vessel? Do you have to moor or not moor? And I think these are a number of discussions. Uh, our opinion is that mooring is not necessary if your vessel has a good dynamic positioning system. Uh, if, of course, you travel with a, an old vessel uh, which has been retrofitted, then you may have a problem. You need other solutions, uh, but it's something that needs to be cleared out. But once that is solved, uh, I don't think there's any problems with the infrastructure. OK, thank you. I see Sam would like to add something. <clears throat> uh, yes, um, uh, the question was about infrastructure. So, well, what, what would be useful for very high autonomy level, so three, four, five, is if you have, um, so if you talk about infrastructure and it's provided by the government, for instance, it needs to be uh, generic and cost effective so that, for instance, uh, Anton and, and we and other companies can use it uh, for their own benefit. So it, it needs to be generic in that sense. And uh, a, when you install, would install a, a, a beacon, so a beacon, beacon with an absolute a position, a ground truth that is also visible with uh, it could be interesting to make it easily detectable uh, so, like a tag for your perception sensor. So something that is clearly visible in, in cameras or in a LIDAR, in a radar, but it has a ground truth of a position. So you already have relative posi position to that beacon. And if these beacons could be, for instance, be installed in critical regions such as locks or, or terminals, I think that would uh, help the autonomy a lot and and it would also allow for more uh, for for less um, um for a more low budget instrumentation on board so it it i'm not i'm not saying that it will but it's it's something interesting to take a to take a look into at least 
Okay, thank you. In the meantime, Flores got back to me to let me know that there is no real comment on conservatism. So um, when I see the timing, I'm afraid that we cannot answer all the 25 questions left, unfortunately. But uh, maybe we can uh, still uh, uh, take care of the question totally up. Um, how competitive are autonomous in uh, waterway vessels with trucks? Do we have numbers? And I suppose that probably Eden might know a bit more about this. Uh, it, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. There, the, the, the main question is yes. <laughs> they are competitive for certain for certain routes and certain applications. And I think also what we did for this, uh, also together also with the France Waterweg, we actually developed a tool for this, uh, which is an online platform, which you can actually say calculate the the shift of an existing ship towards a remote controlled ship. And then you can actually compute what, the, what the, the, the cost savings are. And then next to that, we also created an, an, an application where you could actually compare the, the, the transport cost uh, from, from a ship owner, sorry, from a cargo owner point of view. So when you actually compare uh, in a waterway transport uh, next, to, next to road transport. And I think also uh, within the project that yeah, was executed also within the, the Vlaamse Waterweg, you could actually see that there are some some business cases that could be made and you could actually save some some money and i think it was up to the order of magnitude but it depends from ship size to ship size to ship size between 20 25 percent more or less if i'm not mistaken in, in that that order of magnitude as cost savings from the ship owner point of view okay thank you somebody else would like to add something no, maybe an additional question to Edwin, because it, autonomous trucks is also moving fast and, and that would be a game changer as well. Uh, yeah. So I don't know yeah. if you have any, any more on that on, on, uh, from your models. Yeah, that, that's, the, uh, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting one because we, we also within Novimar, we also had the very uh, discussion on the future uh, when, when we make the scenario analysis. And then the question is, what's then the future? We did, we did another project that's not linked to this. It's a project that we did for the region of Northern and Westphalia a few years ago. And that was about the future of uh, rail transport and road transport. And then we actually developed scenarios where you have these platoons, fully electric trucks with uh, little to no uh, truck drivers and, and, and railway operations where you could double stack trains, make trains longer, faster operations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that if the other modes are also changing, in a waterway transport has to change, otherwise <laughs> they risk uh, losing their share in the modal split. That's uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you. We are almost out of time, unfortunately. I would like to ask Natasha to open the last poll for this uh, session. Um, and I would like to ask uh, all of you, uh, what's the most valuable thing you've learned today? And maybe uh, something different for our panelists. What is like your key message towards uh, the public? You can just also, if you have access to the slider, you can just write it down. Then we have the whole uh, screen full. Give you some time to fill in. I promise Eddie won't get angry because this is an important question. Okay, it's like this. So we have a, a lot of uh, comments on that a lot is happening. We need a better startup ecosystem, I see. My octopus has mentioned. <laughs> more approach than we thought some questions on failures and questions concerning the next steps to be taken great and i think uh, you can go on with the uh, posting online i'll just uh, give you my own uh, wrap up what i um, will remember from this uh, webinar is uh, the focus on uh, sustainability and the needs of the renewal of the fleets and that there are also uh, chances for the smaller ships but uh, automation might also have some uh, positive effects for bigger ships but the focus here was more smaller ones um, conservatism is a, a part of the sector but as edwin mentioned it can also be seen as something positive um, 
Inside the Q&A, I also saw a lot of people mentioning um, crew qualifications with regards to, for example, shore control center. That's something we couldn't uh, talk about today, but that's also a very relevant uh, topic. A lot of questions concerning regulation. I think that uh, deserves a webinar of a whole day on its own. It's a very interesting topic. Um, and something else uh, is cooperation. Eh? We have uh, just five presenters with uh, very interesting projects. Um, they all talked about the need of cooperation, but I'm sure there are much more projects going on right now in Europe, even in the world. And uh, yeah, that's what I think personally, if we want to uh, um, support the inland waterway sector and make it grow and make it sustainable on the long term, we need to cooperate and uh, yeah, work together. But that's the same, <laughs> the same expression. All right. In the meantime, still a lot of people are posting. Um, ah, maybe something else I would like to uh, tell you. Um, I also saw some practical questions inside the Q&A, so we will take care of them. Uh, for example, I saw somebody asking about a certain report, so I will go through them and we will make sure these questions are answered. Um, the Novi Mart movie has to be shared as well. Um, and I think I'm not so familiar with Slido, but I think uh, everybody still has access to the whole overview of questions. So uh, maybe if you really want to have an answer on something, you can contact one of the panelists yourself and uh, have a discussion uh, ongoing. All right, then uh, if nobody wants to add anything anymore, I wish you a very nice day here. The sun is shining, uh, I hope, at your place as well. Um, thank you very much and uh, hopefully see you again. Oh yeah, and I see applause. Yes, applause for everybody because it was a, a great webinar. Very well done, Anne-Sophie. Congratulations. And you too. Yes, very ah, nice webinar. Um, a question about the recording. Um, I have no idea how it will be shared. That's uh, the people from Syntef doing it, but uh, it will be shared somehow. So we will keep you posted. All right. And, uh, Enjoy your lunch, enjoy the rest of the day, and uh, see you hopefully live soon again, if not online. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm,